Hi, everyone. Welcome and good evening. My name is Lauren Artilles, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, I'm honored to introduce this virtual event with David Wallace, presenting his latest book, Philosophy of Physics, a very short introduction, in conversation with Jacob Berendez. I hope everyone's week is off to a good, slightly late start. Thank you so much for joining us virtually tonight. Today's event is the latest installment in our Harvard Science Book Talk series, which works to bring the authors of recently published science literature to our Cambridge community and beyond. Our fantastic fall schedule is off to a great start. Coming up in the series on Wednesday, October 20th, we'll host cosmologist Stefan Alexander for his new book, Fear of a Black Universe, An Outsider's Guide to the Future of Physics. To learn more about this and our other upcoming virtual events, you can visit harvard.com and sign up for our email newsletter or check out the page harvard.com backslash science for more info. We also have a Science Research Public Lectures YouTube channel. We can view previous talks that you might have missed and I'll be sharing the link to that in the chat shortly. Tonight's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our authors at any time during the talk, just click on the Q&A button on your screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. In the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase Philosophy of Physics on harvard.com, as well as a link to donate in support of this series and our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. So thank you so much to our partners at Harvard University and to all of you for showing up and tuning in in support of authors, publishers, indie bookselling, and especially for science. And finally, as you may have experienced in previous virtual gatherings, technical issues may arise. So if they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. Thank you for your patience and understanding. And now I'm delighted to introduce this evening's speakers. David Wallace is the Mellon Chair in Philosophy of Science at the University of Pittsburgh and has joint affiliations with the Department of Philosophy and the Department of History and Philosophy of Science at Pittsburgh. He has previously taught at Oxford University and the University of Southern California, and he has worked on many areas of philosophy of physics, including statistical mechanics, symmetry, quantum field theory, and quantum gravity. But he is best known for his work on the Everett or the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. Jacob Berendez is a theoretical physicist and philosopher of science at Harvard University. He currently serves as lecturer and co-director of graduate studies for the physics PhD department program at Harvard, where he teaches courses on the fundamentals of theoretical physics, classical electromagnetism, general relativity, and the history and philosophy of quantum mechanics. He is also a faculty affiliate of the Harvard Black Hole Initiative. His research publications span the foundations of quantum theory, philosophy of science, and quantum field theory, and he also organizes an international workshop series on physics and philosophy. Tonight, they'll be discussing David's latest book, Philosophy of Physics, part of Oxford University Press's Very Short Introduction series. And without further ado, I'm excited to turn things over to Jacob, who will give us a bit of background on this project and David's work. The digital podium is all yours, Jacob. Thanks so much, Lauren, and thanks to the Harvard Bookstore and everyone involved with the Science Book Talk series for all your hard work making events like this possible. Thanks also to David Wallace for taking the time to talk with all of us. I'm really looking forward to this discussion. I'd like to preface our conversation with some remarks about Professor Wallace and his new book, Philosophy of Physics, A Short Introduction. And right here, it's a very good book. Uh, Professor Wallace is a remarkable figure in the philosophy community, a real philosopher's philosopher. Uh, Professor Wallace is widely respected in the field for his expansive research interests, his clear explanations, and his rigorous approach. I've always learned a lot from his talks and his writing. I, I hope he hasn't been bothered too much by all my questions over the years. Um, his new book is the real deal. It's a serious introductory treatment of the subject and I'm thrilled that Professor Wells wrote it and made it available to the wider public. Uh, if you wanna get a real sense of what philosophers of physics are thinking about, what we're doing, then I highly recommend reading this book. I very much enjoyed it. It's the kind of book where as you're reading, you say to yourself, hey, why didn't he bring up this issue? Oh, wait. He does in the next paragraph. Great. <laughs> you do it over and over again. Manages to, to think of everything. Um, this is definitely a book I'd include in teaching a course on philosophy of physics. All right. So with that, let me start by asking Professor Wallace, maybe you could begin by setting the stage a little bit for all of us. Why did you write this book? What were your goals? I mean, the short, the short and the immediate answer is, is always the, the, the you, you see a gap you see you see a gap, a gap and you wish to fill it I, I think there's been a lot of um if you look at introductions you can find to philosophy of physics um 
you can find a bunch of books um, that very much start as a philosopher's route and start with sort of classical physics and classic issues in physics and maybe at the end of the book just about make their way into more contemporary physics. And you can find a bunch of popular science books, some very good books, um, which touch on philosophical um, topics in passing as they explain quantum theory or the theory of relativity or something like that. But I didn't think there was really a good generally accessible explanation of what philosophy of physics itself was and what the questions it currently engages with are. I mean, those questions by and large are connected with some of the more cutting edge bits of physics um, with quantum theory, with statistical mechanics and thermal physics, um, with special and general relativity, with the kind of things that um, are the bread and butter of contemporary theoretical physics. Uh, and I think if you don't present philosophy of physics in a way that really showcases the way it engages with these contemporary pieces of physics, you miss the kind of beating heart of the subject. Uh, equally, I think while there are wonderful popular presentations of quantum mechanics, of relativity, to some extent even in thermal physics, um, they, they tend to kind of downplay what's philosophically and conceptually contentious about those frameworks. You, you can read these accounts and you know, with the partial exception of quantum theory, you can get the impression that of course in the historical development of these subjects, there were conceptual puzzles. Thank goodness we've solved them all. Um, and, and I wanted to write something that, uh, that got across to people the fact that these sort of deep conceptual controversies are, are still there, they're still important. Um, they're things that, um, that, that, that can inform and be informed by current physics. They're things that should be interesting to practitioners of the subject and not just to sort of historians or lay observers. That's great. It's good leading to my next question. So um, what exactly is philosophy of physics? Is it is it a part of philosophy or philosophy of science? Is it part of physics? Is it something else entirely? Well, as I say in the book, um, then even asking that question two or 300 years ago wouldn't have made sense. I mean, uh, I, I think of philosophy as what, you, as what you do when you're confused and when you haven't got the subject clear enough that you've got um, a clear and agreed methodology. And so you know, 300 years ago, uh, philosophy was physics and physics was philosophy. And, after Galileo, after Newton, after the developments of the 17th century, then you start seeing a delineated theory of physics. Um, but you still have a bunch of uh, conceptual puzzles all the way through physics, questions about what space and time and motion are, questions about uh, where assumptions come into the theory about the direction of time, questions about how you understand the quantum parts of the theory. There were always foundational questions of this kind. Newton wrote philosophy of physics, Einstein did philosophy of physics. Um, and so a big part of the subject, I mean, the part I'm most engaged with really is this set of conceptual foundational questions that are really continuous with the practice of physics itself. Um, in addition to that, um, you know, that's the sense, I suppose, in which philosophy of physics is kind of like physics. Philosophy of physics is kind of like philosophy of science because um, good philosophy of science has to engage with the details of the science. You can't go around asking how does the scientific method work if your prototype for what a scientific law is is something like all Fs are Gs. Um, science, science, scientific theories don't look like that at all. Um, you need to you need to keep up with examples from science to to do good philosophy of science. And thirdly, um, if you want to do core philosophy, if you want to ask questions about metaphysics, questions about epistemology, those questions kind of started off um, as, well, as I say, as, as indistinguishable from, um, from physics questions. And, and there's still been this addition of answering those questions that regards them as being sort of wholly owned and operated by philosophy. But most philosophers would recognize that if we want to do metaphysics and understand the deep structure of the world, then we're going to need to be informed by what's going on in physics. Um, so there's, and the sort of common thread there is philosophy of physics is sitting between physics and the philosophy of science and general philosophy. And um, the, the discipline is, is often about bringing tools and ideas from one of those areas um, where they can be useful in another of them. Thanks. So you mentioned uh, metaphysics and epistemology. Just you know, for, for the benefit of everybody who's here, what do these mean and how are they related to physics? 
Why are they uh, something that a philosopher of physics would care about? Okay, good. So, so metaphysics um, is kind of asking questions about what's the what's the deep nature of the world like? Um, what uh, classic metaphysical questions would mean something like um, uh, why is um, wh why am I now the same entity as I was yesterday? Um, can we think of the world as having fundamental building blocks and how can we understand the way in which larger things relate to smaller things? What are the ways in which mathematics connects to the description of reality? And, and a whole bunch of questions with this time. What's the nature of causation? Um, a lot of those questions sound half like physics and they are half like physics. Um, there's a style of doing metaphysics that doesn't pay that much attention to what's in physics. And I think that style, if it made sense 300 years ago, is, is pretty questionable now. There's a style of doing or, or not doing metaphysics that says this is, a, this is a waste of time and you should just carry on doing physics. I, I think that fails to recognize there are certain sorts of questions that physics is never quite directly going to answer by itself. Uh, I think good metaphysics is, um, is about asking questions about the, the structure of the world on many levels and, and on many and a level of generality that's broader than science, but informed by science. And epistemology um, literally again means our theory of knowledge, how we come to learn about the world. Um, and some aspects of that are connected with very sort of, if you like, ordinary person level questions like that, like how, um, uh, how do I think about the evidence of my senses? To what extent can I know something through the testimony of others? Is there a, a fundamental difference between me uh, knowing what's on the wall of your room because you've told me versus because I've seen it across your Zoom channel versus because I'm standing in your room right now and looking at them? Um, but a lot of our theory of knowledge these days is our theory of scientific knowledge. So epistemology sort of flows into the method of science. And there's been a tradition right through the 20th century of thinking that um, there's going to be no principal distinction between understanding epistemology and understanding the scientific method. Thanks a lot. Um, so maybe you could paint a, a, a different picture. What is it that philosophers of physics actually do? Like, what does your working day look like? I, I imagine a lot of people imagine that you're sitting in an armchair just, just thinking really hard about things. But like, what is it, what is it that philosophers of physics do every day? Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a bit of the sitting in armchairs, although I tend to walk around when I'm thinking. Um, so, you, I mean, th thinking specifically of the sort of research aspect of what you do with your time, as, as, as you know, quite a lot of what an academic is doing is a, bu is a bunch of things that's pretty much the same from philosophy to history to physics. But um, when, when I get a day that's a research day, um, it involves reading a lot. Um, to some extent, it involves calculating. Um, yeah, I, I spend a lot less time doing calculational mathematics than a theoretical physicist would do, but I don't, I don't spend no time doing it. A lot of it involves writing. I mean, the, the, the stereotype of the philosopher who sits in the armchair and thinks, um, these days they tend to pull the armchair up to a computer and you tend to, you tend to think through typing to a large extent. You don't tend to know reliably what your, um, uh, what your argument's going to be until you've you've tried to put it in writing. And a huge amount of what I spend my time doing is talking to other people, whether that means um, by email or um, through Zoom conversations or you know, increasingly as the pandemic abates actually in person. Um, you know, the, a subject like this, if it's interdisciplinary, requires you to spend a lot of time uh, comparing notes with other people, um, finding people in physics who are interested in these topics and seeing how their perspective on it compares to yours, asking just technical silly questions, um, you know, like uh, you know, you, you, you've understood the subject as, as well as you can through um, textbook and review article level understanding and reading about it. And, and you need that level of understanding to ask good questions, but you'll never fully understand something just on the basis of that. You need to actually talk to experts and engage with what they think. So, so a, a random one of my days is gonna be kind of mixture of reading and learning, um, presenting my ideas to others and, and hearing about their ideas, um, uh, scribbling things on a whiteboard or on a, a notepad and trying to calculate, think things through, trying to write up arguments and see where they go wrong. And a certain amount of just sitting in the armchair and thinking. 
I, I, I should just just as a as an important uh, uh, note to everybody, I don't recommend uh, pushing an armchair up to a computer. It's not not good for the posture. It's not, <laughs> not good. Um, so you mentioned mathematics. Uh, what what role does mathematics play in the work of a philosopher of physics? How does that compare with maybe other areas of philosophy? Um, I, I just say, you, you know, in my experience, philosophers of physics do a tremendous amount of mathematics. I mean, we're here to talk about um, your more recent book, but uh, your earlier book, uh, which I also highly recommend, The Emergent Multiverse, has a tremendous amount of very rigorous mathematics of it. Um, so maybe talk a little bit about that, but I, maybe more broadly, what kinds of skills and interests uh, would someone need to pursue an academic career in philosophy of physics? I, I happen to know that there are some people in the audience who, who are interested. So I'd, I'd be curious if you're willing to share a little about that. Sure. I, I mean, let me ask both, answer both of those separately, although they, they kind of overlap. Um, I mean, as, as you know, you can't do physics without mathematics. You can't even understand physical theories without mathematics. So the minimal level at which you need to use mathematics is that if you want to understand the content of a physical theory, you need to understand the mathematical language it's written in. Um, and that can get very sophisticated very fast. Um, and quite, and to a large extent, if you want to talk about a theory of physics, you need to talk in mathematics. So uh, a typical philosophy of physics paper will have a lot more words in it than a typical theoretical physics paper, but it's quite unusual to find a philosophy of physics paper that has no equations at all. Um, as a rule, as a philosopher of physics, you're, you're a consumer of mathematics, I think, more than a producer. Um, so uh, there, there are some theorems and some calculations in my more technical work in, in my other book, which I'm kind enough to mention. Um, but to a large extent, I'm presenting and discussing and using uh, the mathematical work done by others. I, I suppose one, one difference, or another difference between the sort of paper even quite a technical philosopher of physics might write and, and a, a physics paper is in, in a physics paper, very often the words are a sort of not, not that much more than a decoration to the, um, the, 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 the carrying out of the argument in mathematics. I, I've had conversations with, with uh, physicists who have discovered that some philosopher of physics has close read some of the words they put in their paper and they're kind of horrified. They, they, they say, well, I, I kind of bashed that bit up quite late. What I actually wanted to present was the calculation. Um, that's really not the case in a, a philosophy of physics paper. The, the words and, and, the, and, the, and the verbal argument is carrying a lot of what you're doing, but you often still still need the, the math to interface with what's, what the actual content of the theory is. And, and sometimes you're actually proving a theorem. Sometimes you're actually, you, you need some consequence of a theory and the way you extract the consequence of the theory is proving something about it or calculating something in it. As far as the skill set you need, um, so, I always, used to, I always tend to think that philosophy of physics, because it's interdisciplinary, is being disciplined by at least one of kind of core philosophy, um, applied mathematics, um, mainstream theoretical physics, or, or the history of the science. So you need to be able to do at least one of those things. Um, so my own background is in theoretical physics. Uh, I, did, I did a physics PhD, um, and then as the questions became I was interested in increasingly started being sort of the, the questions that were a better fit for a philosophy of physics program. I, I kind of moved across at the after my PhD. Other people come in from the pure math background. Other people come in with, um, uh, with a pure philosophy background. Um, some people come from history of science. Um, you need to know, to do, to do the, the contemporary philosophy of physics, you need to know enough physics to be able to read the research literature. So you need graduate, you, you need to have, you need to have, or you need to have acquired at least kind of graduate level um, physics, the, the kind of level you get at doing grad courses um, in, a, in a physics PhD. But often, a lot of people will pick that up informally rather than, um, uh, rather than through having done a, a proper physics PhD or masters. Um, I think a lot of what you need really though is, is um, uh, is a willingness to to do a sort of work that means you know you're never going to know all of that material so you're always going to engage with other people to get it and um, yeah I, in, in the field i what i tend to bring to the table is a reasonably strong grounding in the kind of messy methodology and style of doing things that that modern modern physics tends to use and i'm I know how to read the, the theoretical physics literature and I know and I know kind of how to intuit the kind of approximations and rough edges in a physics calculation. 
Um, I, I, I respect the history of physics, for instance, enough, enough not to try doing it myself, um, because I know, I, I, I know people who do it well, and I, I kind of learn from them if I want to make a historical observation in my work. Um, I, I learn from people who, whose skill is in a purer and more rigorous style of mathematics. Um, I learn from people who are better connected to, um, to sort of core, uh, core philosophy. And I know enough of those disciplines to ask sensible questions about them. I mean, you can't, you can't do interdisciplinary work without knowing quite a lot about a bit of the discipline that isn't your own specialization, because without that, you can't ask the intelligent questions. That, that's great. And, and your, your comment before about words, it, it, it's, it's very true. I mean, I, I, I can remember times when I would pace for hours thinking about a single word and making sure it was exactly the right word that needed to be said. And it's a very different style from when I'm doing physics. Mm. Um, so let me move on a little, little bit uh, uh, more, more cl closer to the book. Um, so you okay. talk a lot in the book about what seem like pretty tangible ways in which philosophy of physics has changed and evolved over time. Uh, I know I often get this question a lot. I'm interested to hear your thoughts on it. Uh, what does it mean for any discipline in philosophy to make progress? Good. So the normal line I have about this, although in honesty, it's not a super good fit to philosophy of physics, is that the way you get really major progress in philosophy is that you stop calling the area in question um, philosophy. It goes back to my comment about, about physics breaking off from philosophy. So, um, you know, do a, a classic philosophical question, for instance, is what's the nature of matter? Um, not just in the sort of, ab not, not in some very abstracted, uh, what could it possibly be for the matter, but, you know, is matter made out of particles or not, for instance? That was a, that was a philosophical question in antiquity. Um, it was a philosophical question. We made such fantastic strides in answering that we've stopped calling the area of philosophy that studied that question philosophy. Um, you know, ma mathematics uh, is, a, is a big piece of philosophical pro progress from antiquity. Physics is a big piece of philosophical progress from the 17th century. Uh, evolutionary biology is a big piece of philosophical progress from the 19th century. Computer science is a big piece of philosophical progress in the 20th century, and, 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 and so on. So that, that, that's the really, that's the kind of big picture way in which philosophy makes profound progress. Um, at the smaller scale, I, I think philosophical progress generally comes from clarity. So um, one, um, one understands what's at stake in a, in a debate more and one knows what presuppositions are relevant for, um, uh, for certain points of view. So to take a, an intractable example, think about the problem of free will. Um, have we made progress on the problem of free will in philosophy? Well, no, in the sense that we haven't moved from a lack of consensus to a consensus. Um, yes, in the sense that the landscape of, of options there is, is vastly better understood, that the kind of the versions of, say, the compatibilist position that free will is not fundamentally in conflict with a deterministic universe, that, that's something we just understand way better than we understood in the 18th or 19th century. And it's something, again, which we understand in much better dialogue with cognitive science uh, and physics than we did in the 19th century. In philosophy of physics particularly, because it's so interdisciplinary, um, I think it's, um, it's hard to completely separate what counts as progress here from what counts as progress in the, the more extremely conceptual ends of, of physics. I, I think the, um, the way we talk about quantum mechanics in, in, in advanced textbooks these days, in discussions of the quantum classical transition these days, in the way in which people in string theory or quantum field theory talk about um, about measurement these days. Those ways of doing quantum mechanics are noticeably different and I think more sophisticated and informed than they were in say the 1970s. Um, and while I wouldn't want to say that uh, philosophy of physics defined institutionally has been the major driver of those things, I think there's a continuity and a, and a flow there. So the, the interdisciplinary task of understanding quantum mechanics has advanced really very substantially in, in the last 30 years. And you see those advances in the way the subject is used. It's just, a, there's a kind of confusion of the way people talked about quantum mechanics in the 70s, all over the literature, um, that is very much more in abeyance in, um, in the 2020s. We understand quantum mechanics better than we did. And understanding quantum mechanics in that level 
is what I call what I regard as a philosophy of physics project. As, as I say in the book, it's a book about um, philosophy of physics as a, a kind of a subject matter and not um, not so much where it's done institutionally. And it's, it was a bit of an embarrassment to the institutional discipline of philosophy of physics, the, the, the clearly most influential philosopher of physics of the 20th century is Einstein and the clearly second most influential philosopher of physics of the 20th century is John Bell. And both of these people are physicists. Um, I think my, my discipline hasn't always done worked as hard as it could to actually make those interdisciplinary links and that talking to people across the fields um, as, as it could be. Um, but but it, it, it does to some extent. And again, if you step back and you look at the actual philosophy of physics questions, whether they're being done by physicists or mathematicians or philosophers or all of them, then uh, that, 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 that clarity and understanding of what we're doing and the way that informs more practical physics, that's how we make progress. Yeah, so it's, it's, it, there's the, the question of the institution of philosophy of physics, but also the style of philosophy of physics. And the style of philosophy, philosophy of physics is something that physicists have practiced also. And, and sometimes practicing it has led to significant uh, progress. Um, okay, uh, so um, so another uh, question um, you know that I, I often get from people uh, is how 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 is philosophy of physics in, in your experience? Um, I mean, people don't ask me about your experience, but in general, they ask me. You know, I, I'm asking you. Um, in your experience, uh, what is, what, what are, how have perceptions about philosophy has exchanged in the academic community, in particular among physicists? Do you feel like there's been some growth and evolution there? Uh, how so? What are your thoughts about that? So I'm optimistic about this. Um, I think that, uh, well, I, I suppose just, just personally, I don't find it very difficult to have conversations with at least a respectable fraction of people in physics about these topics. I mean, the majority of people in physics are not interested and that's fine. Um, I mean, uh, we want, there needs to be a division of labor. Uh, it, it's important that not everyone is spending their time predominantly thinking about foundational questions. Um, and everyone has finite, um, finite time as to which, which conversations and which intellectual activities they want to engage with. And that's good. Um, you know, the, there, there are people in quantum field theory who just don't, who, whose, whose research style and approach to doing things just doesn't really need to engage with philosophy of, of physics, just as there are people in, in, in biochemistry who don't need to engage with physics um, at, 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 at a deep level. But, but, in, but many physicists are really interested in these conceptual questions. Um, and I think the trend is positive in terms of more people being willing to engage there. I think that that partly reflects the fact that philosophy of physics has successfully upped its game, or you know, philosophers engaged in physics, if you like, have successfully upped their game over the last 40 or 50 years. If you, you went back to the 60s or something, you'd find virtually no expertise in the technical content of physics among philosophers. Uh, over the ensuing period, you find that over the 70s and 80s, philosophers get quite um, on top of a lot of the formalism of um, general relativity and space-time theories and start doing really very technical work on that. Over the 80s and 90s, that starts happening with quantum mechanics. Over the 90s and 2000s, that starts happening with statistical mechanics. Over the 2000s and 2010s, it happens with quantum field theory. I also think the last 10 or... This is a bit difficult to separate from my own research preferences because in some ways I'm describing one style of the subject that I think is good, but I think there's been a growth in... Um, in the subject in the last 10 or 20 years in engaging with slightly more of the messy practice of physics. Uh, I think one of the problems that philosophy of physics has sometimes had in engaging with physicists is philosophers have had slightly too pure and pristine an idea of what a, a theory in physics looks like. Uh, I mean, there's a style of doing physics with mathematicians like where everything is utterly rigorous and results are not merely uh, calculated, but really proved. Um, and that style of doing physics has made important contributions, but most of physics, as you know, is not in that key. Um, and by and large, that method of mathematical rigor is not practical as a way of proceeding with physics. And you, you just spend far, far too much time dotting I's and crossing T's and not enough time exploring. And, and to some extent, you'd be looking for an inappropriate rigor as, on a subject that you're still trying to develop and work out how to formalize. And um, so I think philosophy of physics has... I think one of the good developments of the last 20 years has been an increasing willingness to engage in those sort of subjects. Um, I, I also think that some of philosophers, some, some of physicists um, 
suspicion of philosophy, if you like, comes from the quantum measurement problem and the, the puzzle of just how to make sense of quantum mechanics. Um, and I think, um, in my experience, physicists are a lot more willing to have conceptual conversations when they're not about the measurement problem. Um, and uh, part of that, I think, is that the measurement problem, or aspects of the measurement problem, aspects of the how do we understand quantum mechanics problem, um, have been sort of a bit sterile in physics. They, uh, there are ways in which they've led to really interesting, important developments, but certain aspects of asking those questions, they haven't seemed to physicists to be that relevant to the kinds of things they're doing. If you get physicists engaged in a conceptual question that they think is relevant to what they're doing, they're really happy to have a conceptual level conversation. And a classic example of this is the, the set of questions about whether black holes are ordinary thermal systems, or how we should understand radiation from black holes, how we should reconcile the fact that quantum theory doesn't seem to involve ever losing information about something with the fact that things that disappear into black holes appear to be lost forever, even when they come out as thermal radiation. Those are deeply conceptual questions. Um, but the high energy physics community has been agonizing about those questions for half a decade, half a century. Um, so it's absolutely not that physicists don't care about conceptual questions, but it's easier to have those conversations where the questions seem to link into other activities. It's also frankly easier to have conversations about philosophy of physics with physicists if you use the word conceptual rather than the word philosophical. And you should absolutely avoid the word metaphysical. It's a good tip, thank you. Um, so your book mentions many different branches of uh, philosophy of physics, but it focuses on three uh, core areas that are particularly important historically, uh, continue to be important today. Um, yeah. I figured we would take maybe another 10, 15 minutes to talk about these, then we'll open things up to uh, audience questions. I see some questions already showing up. Um, so let's address these one at a time and we'll get to quantum mechanics, that's the third one. <laughs> but I want to start with space, time, and motion. Mm. So I'm, I'm hoping you can say a little bit about uh, what are some of the outstanding foundational questions, conceptual questions, <laughs> conceptual <laughs> questions uh, that philosophers of physics have had, continue to have about time and space, and are any of these still open questions that are still being actively discussed today? Good. Yeah, so the, I mean, I, st I start the, the section of the book that talks about this with Newtonian physics and, and the kind of classic questions there were, do we want to think of motion as something that is relative or um, yeah, does, is, is, is the movement of, of a body similarly to be understood as motion relative to other bodies? If it's, or, or is it to be thought about as a movement against some kind of absolute background? Um, and, and the nature of the debate in the 17th century was sort of very much, um, well, uh, the, um, we, 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 we have a problem conceptually with the idea that motion should be anything other than relative motion, but relative motion just doesn't seem adequate for the science we want to do. We want to say that objects continue in a straight line at constant speed, unless acted on by a force. Um, if motion's relative, then something's moving in a straight line with respect to some objects and not with other objects. Um, so trying to get a trying to get a clear notion of what motion was and and what and 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 how to think about um, about relative as absolute notions of motion was really important to seventeenth century uh, mechanics centuries and 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 this this might seem more of a surprise to to people but it, the, the, those questions haven't really gone away. Um, the, the popular idea of this is that sort of the theory of relativity in a way. Um, told us that yes, all motion is relative and that was the end of the story. But as, as you know, of course, that that's not at all what happened. The, the, the principle of relativity basically says that physics looks the same in a reference frame that's moving as it does in a reference frame that's stationary. But in the first place, um, that principle was, was, was worked out by Galileo in the 17th century. Um, Einstein made incredible contributions in his development of the theory of relativity, but that wasn't one of them. Um, and secondly, the very, the very notion of saying, well, physics in a moving reference frame um, is different from physics in a stationary reference frame, that, um, that question, uh, that way of putting it kind of relies on this idea of what a reference frame really is. And again, you can't simply reduce that to um, some arrangement of matter because there's no arrangement of matter that is itself not acted on by other forces. So trying to understand the nature of of motion here is really still playing a part in the foundations of, um, of special relativity. You can see 
versions of these questions transformed, but not not unchanged, not 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 transformed out of recognition in thinking about about the what's really going on in the structure of general relativity. You can even see it in, in some of the foundational questions in quantum gravity. And, and that question relates to sort of the other question that was a little less obvious in 17th century physics, but is more clear now, which is the nature of symmetry. So symmetries are, in some sense, transformations that seem to take one state of affairs to a different state of affairs, but in some sense, an indistinguishable state of affairs. The principle of relativity is a principle of symmetry. Physics looks the same in stationary moving frames. Um, physics looks the same if you, if, you, if, if you move to a different place. Physics looks the same if I turn into a different, turn in a different direction. Um, and symmetry is up there with quantum mechanics and relativity as the core unifying, you know, one of the core unifying principles of the 20th century revolutions in, in, in physics. Um, but symmetry remains sort of deeply puzzling in lots and lots of ways. Um, and you know, phys um, physicists puzzle about symmetry. Um, we deepen our understanding of symmetry. Um, trying to know what's going on in symmetry is, is, is in, in many ways indistinguishable now from the, the general question of just how we understand motion. Uh, you say at one point in your book, um, I think this is a, a direct quotation, you, you say hardly anyone really thinks in four dimensions. <laughs> I may have read this somewhat differently for most people because when I read that, I thought to myself, hardly. <laughs> is there someone out there you, you know whom I don't know who actually thinks in four dimensions or are you just being like a rigorous philosopher and I not wanting Roger, to say a blanket statement? <laughs> I, I think Roger Penrose claims you can think in four dimensions sometimes and I'm not going to argue with him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a fair point. I know, um, I, I know, I know mathematicians who will sometimes say that you know, they'll use certain sorts of um, ways of visualizing four dimensions. They'll, they'll try to borrow time as a way of visualizing a an object chain you know if you look that if you look at object in a different time is a kind of surrogate for looking for looking at different three-dimensional cross sections um but i, th I think I, mean, I think this again might be a quote from penrose something some kind of you know, maybe maybe you can maybe there are ways of helping yourself think in four dimensions but in doing physics we need to be able to think in six times ten to the power 23 dimensions and no one can do that <laughs> so at some point you're always going to have to stop doing that that's a fair point um so Later in the book, you talk about statistical mechanics, but before I get to statistical mechanics yes. specifically, um, you, you know, before we get to statistical mechanics specifically, mm. you talk about some more primordial concepts that play a very important role in statistical mechanics and that our attempts to understand statistical mechanics have, have, have influenced, right? Our understanding of probability mm. and our understanding of, on one side, reductionism and the other side, emergence. Yeah. You also talk about this notion of autonomous laws. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about these concepts because they're very tricky. Uh, yeah. So, uh, and and some of them are maybe more familiar to people, like probability, or at least they feel more familiar to people. When I teach classes that involve probability, I always start by asking students to define what a probability is, and it's always a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, but uh, so maybe you could you could talk a little bit about these concepts, and maybe especially the ones like reductionism and emergence and autonomous laws that might be less familiar. Sure. Sure. Well, let me talk quickly about probability and then a bit more about emergence. I mean, probability is one of these classic concepts that we know how to use but can't explain what it is. Um, uh, I used to, when, when I was at Oxford, um, you, we, you, you have interviews for students um, to decide who, who gets on graduate places, and that's actually a faculty job in the UK. And one of the questions I used to ask people was, I, I had two, I had, um, I had two dice. Uh, I had a die, and I asked, "What's the probability of getting six if I roll the dice?" And, because it's an extremely easy question to answer. And then I asked them what the statement meant. Um, and I'm not expecting an, a, a correct answer because there isn't really any consensus of a correct answer. But what you find is people will quickly try things like, well, there are six possible ways the die could have landed, which won't do. That does the, uh, there are problems with that. Or if you roll the dice lots and lots of times, you go six, about one sixth of the time, and there are problems with that. There's just really no completely satisfactory philosophical account of probability. Um, and um, it's very much something where we, we know and we see it, but we're still wide open just how to think about it. And that, uh, and that comes up a lot in statistical mechanics, which is very much a, a subject that you get when you bring probability concepts into ordinary mechanics. It's also a subject that's really concerned with this relation between descriptions of the world on different scales. Um, and I think in some ways that's the deeper aspect of the theory. Um, the, one of the really important things to understand about physics is we don't really have one theory of physics. We have thousands of theories of physics. We have 
uh, our, our theory of neutron decay and our theory of superconductors and our theory of plasmas in situations where you can neglect short distance interactions and our theories of plasmas in regimes where you can't do that and our understanding of copper and our understanding of the structure of the sun and, and so on. And we know a lot about how these subjects connect one to the other, but we very often know a lot more about how to describe the world at some level of description than we do um, about how that level of description relates to some lower level of description. So physicists often use the term phenomenological to describe situations where I've got an account of what something's doing that doesn't reduce to its microphysical constituents. So um, we had a phenomenological understanding of superconductors long before we um, had a microscopic understanding of why that phenomenological account was correct. And there are still superconductors for which the phenomenological account works fine, but we don't really have a, a microphysical understanding of them. Um, so what we're really doing in physics is gaining evidence and information about the world at lots and lots of different scales, and then trying to see how the different levels of scales are stitched together. Um, and when, when physicists in their more expansionist moments say that the standard model of particle physics underpins every experiment you could possibly do in physics, all of that has an enormous promissory note about being able to do all of those, um, all of those stitchings together. I mean, if, if my particular experiment was something like I'll take a glass and drop it on a hard floor and ask how many bits it breaks into, um, uh, good luck calculating that from the standard model of particle physics. <laughs> so there's a lot of... Um, but that doesn't mean that we don't understand anything about these connections. I think we understand a lot of them. We have a partial and deepening understanding of the connections. A fantastic amount of physics is about how to do these, um, how, to, how to understand these connections. And statistical mechanics in many ways is the language we use to do these con connections. And, and then the puzzles about this, are, the way I break it down in the book is sort of twofold. There are two funny things that happen when you go from lower level physics to higher level physics. One of the funny things that happens is probabilities turn up. That goes back to the earlier comment. And the other, and I think deeper funny thing that happens is that um, processes develop an order in time. Uh, microscopic physics doesn't really care about the difference between the past and the future, but macroscopic physics really does. Um, there's a clear, if I, if I show you that video of the glass breaking, it's completely obvious in which direction I showed you the video. If I showed you a picture of a single ball bouncing, you'd have to pay a lot more attention to know in which direction the video was being played. And the only reason you could really tell was because the ball would gradually slow down. And that's really happening just because the, the, the pretense that there's only that the ball is a single in, indistinguishable, you know, unbreakable particle stops working and the energy leaks out of the system. So, so the philosophy of statistical mechanics is very much about, I think, how to understand these emergence relations, but how to understand them in a way that in particular allows us to understand the role that probability is playing and the way in which we get an irreversibility, a, a, a distinction in past and future. Thanks a lot. So um, we have just a little bit more time uh, before I want to turn to audience questions. Uh, so I, 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 we couldn't miss the opportunity to talk a little bit about quantum mechanics and the <laughs> foundations of quantum mechanics. Um, so you know, obviously we should talk about the measurement problem. It'd be great if you could give uh, a, a nice explanation of the measurement problem. But I think, you know, as you as you pointed out, the measurement problem has been around a long time. I think a lot of people associate philosophy of physics with the measurement problem, in particular philosophy of quantum mechanics with the measurement problem. Uh, but of course, there are other conceptual problems in quantum mechanics that philosophers of physics think about and that physicists also think about. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the measurement problem specifically, but maybe also some of the broader uh, questions that are bothering people today about the foundations of quantum mechanics. Sure. I, I mean, it's may, there may be an interesting disagreement here. I mean, there's a certain sense in which I think that while there are other important problems in philosophy of quantum mechanics, you can't think about any of them without thinking about the measurement problem. Different and I'm anticipating the, what the measurement problem is here, but um, let's just say these are the, the, if there are different ways of understanding quantum theory so profound that they transform almost any specific question you might have about the foundations of quantum theory. Um, but that said, I mean, what, what, what is the measurement problem? Well, quant quantum mechanics, if you take it literally, seems to say that things can be in two places at the same time. It seems to say a particle can be here and there at the same time, or it could be doing two things at the same time. Maybe it says it's spinning to the left and spinning to the right at the same time, or it's going this way and that way at the same time. 
if quantum mechanics was decent enough to keep all of that confined to the microscopic, then we could just say that maybe the microscopic world is counterintuitive and we need new language to describe it. But quantum mechanics itself seems to say that if you inter if you magnify the microscopic up to the macroscopic, you could do that by measurement, hence measurement problem, but you could also do it by any number of natural processes that, that don't happen in the lab, but still magnify small differences up into large consequences. What happens according to the theory is that the doing things, two things at the same time comes to infect the macroscopic. So if I have a measurement device that would point this way of the particle is here and that way of the particle is there, then if the particle is here and there at the same time, then the quantum theory says that the needle is gonna point this way and this way at the same time. Um, and that's not just weird, that just seems pathological. That seems incompatible with our basic observations and basic sanity. Um, I mean, Schrodinger's extreme example is if you kill your cat, if the particle is here and not if it's there, in which case your cat is somehow alive and dead at the same time. So the, the measurement problem is how do you make sense of quantum mechanics and how do you make sense of these situations? Um, some strategies to do that have involved trying to change the equations of quantum mechanics. Um, if the equations of quantum mechanics say that large objects can be in two places at the same time, so much the worse for the equations. Um, the problem with those strategies is that the equations of quantum mechanics are pretty damn well tested. Um, I often joke that philosophers like changing the physics, but physicists are a lot less keen. Um, you could change your, your attempt of how to interpret theories of this kind. You could, for instance, try to say that quantum theory isn't really about the way the world is at all. It's just about probabilities of things. Maybe it's probabilities of measurements. Um, making that work tends to run you either into hard into some hard mathematical no-go theorems about the impossibility of doing that, or into sort of quasi-philosophical problems about how if you ever try to take measurement as some primitive notion that's written into your theory, you just lose all, all ability to analyze the measurements we do in the lab as physical processes. I mean, measure, measurement devices aren't found scattered across the desert by the Lord. They're, um, they're technical gadgets that we build using the tricks of quantum mechanics itself. Um, the way of thinking about the measurement problem I've worked most on goes back to whoever 50 years ago, which says, take more seriously this idea that things are doing two things at the same time. Ask yourself whether that's really contradicted by your observations. Um, and if, and, and in, in asking that, don't, don't, don't consult your intuitions as to what you'd observe, consult physics. And what physics says is if I were to look at a cat that's alive and dead at the same time, I wouldn't see some weird indefinite cat. I would myself at the same time see a live cat and a dead cat. And if I told you about the result, you would at the same time hear me saying a live cat and hear me saying a dead cat. And if you put all those things together, you start getting, and there's more to say than I have time in this moment, but you start getting a picture where um, the world as a whole is doing multiple things at the same time. And, and if you try to understand what that says, it leads you to the sort of many worlds picture where you know, we, we, we just take literally that description of many things happening at the same time. And we realize what it's describing to us is many classical goings on at the same time, not interacting with each other very much. And, that's kind of what a world is. It's great. So we have a couple of audience questions and we have about 10 minutes. I want to make sure we get to them. Um, so uh, I'm going to ask them in no particular order. Uh, let me start with, uh, okay, this is a very good one. So there's a question for either slash both speakers. Uh, <laughs> this is from uh, an experimental condensed matter physicist. Uh, who writes, I agree that philosophers of physics should keep up with developments in physics, but how and to what extent do you think experimentalists should incorporate philosophy of physics into their work? I think it's a particularly good question because, um, you know, th there's a, a, a sense, I think, that a lot of philosophy of physics engages with theoretical physics. And, um, you know, many of the people we associate on the physics side with philosophy of physics, like Einstein and, and John Bell, were theoretical physicists. Yeah. Uh, and I think that there really isn't enough attention to the connection between philosophy, physics, and experiments. So I'd be very interested to hear your, your views on this. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, and I'm not totally sure I know the answer. I mean, to some extent, of course, once you're, once you're in the process of doing your experimental work, then um, the problem is defined in a sufficiently sharp way that probably the conceptual foundations of it aren't, aren't so relevant. Um, but in trying to work out what you want to do and how you think about the, the theory and, and what experiments you want to do, then of course theoretical conceptual ma things matter more. Even so, I kind of, I'm not sure at the level of say the foundations of quantum mechanics, how much the 
how, what what the useful dialogues are between philosophy and experimental physics direct rather than those that are sort of partially mediated through the the, the theoretical physics and pedagogical understanding of the theoretical physics but I but I kind of mean I'm not sure literally um I think Jacob's dead right that a lot of philosophy of physics tends to be engaged more on the theoretical side and even you know, as somebody in the field who's probably a lot closer to physical practice than, than most of my a lot of my colleagues then it's still the case very much the physical practice I'm close to is the, is theoretical practice I, I think there's probably growth areas to to connect more directly there um in terms of what, what what should people be keeping track of in that field, I think you know one should be thinking about quantum mechanics in, in in conceptual ways and trying to understand it well. If philosophers can help there, then great. I I, I think some bits of philosophy of physics, some bits of my philosophy of quantum mechanics, sort of shade into pedagogy, and I don't feel that's a bad thing to say about them. So perhaps just getting a deeper understanding of the quantum theory through reading whoever you find clear on the concepts is, is good and if that happens to be people who are doing philosophy of physics then I'm, I'm I'd be really pleased about that the other thing I'd say I mean not less 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 in condensed metaphysics but in other areas of experiment I mean if one looks at um contemporary cosmology I think there are deep deep methodological questions that are coming up in contexts where you can't repeat the experiment a million times and where you can't do controlled experiments so much and I think I think those are places where some issues from philosophy of physics and even general philosophy of science about what what kind of thing counts as evidence and what kind of experiments are good to do sort of really come to the fore. Uh, you talk actually in, in, in your book about a couple of things that, that, that do seem that they, that they could be particularly relevant to experimentalists. You talk about the theory ladenness of observations, mm -hmm. the difficulty um, in, in, in doing pure observational science because of the important role that theory plays yeah. in how we make sense of our observations. Um, what do you think experimentalists should know about the theory ladenness of observations? I, I think the truth is they know it anyway. I mean, um, uh, any good experimental physicist knows perfectly well um, that uh, you're, you're you're not remotely just get it. You're not, it's not like it's not like what happens in an undergraduate lab where you just turn up for your lab course and the experiment is all set up and then you run it and collect the data and and and, and run, analyze about it. Um, you know, coaxing and persuading the physical world to give you data is um, is just an impossible activity without a sort of deep understanding of the the gadgetry you're building. I mean, I mean, CERN is the extreme example of this. Of course, there is nobody nobody on the face of the earth understands how CERN works in totality. Um, that that's theory laden of observation, if you like. The the claim that CERN observed the Higgs boson is absolutely true, but it relies on uh, so many pieces of our theoretical understanding of all the various bits that it, it the, and then so much collaboration about that, um, that you realize how distant something like observing the Higgs boson is from the sort of philosopher's caricature of an observation, which is something you do with your eyes. Right. The, 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 I don't know um, uh, what maybe the, the general public uh, understands about what it meant to see the Higgs, but it wasn't like we saw the Higgs zoom through visually right, exactly. the screen right I mean, people yeah, are looking exactly. at histograms and there's a tremendous amount of of work you have to do to understand why uh, you know a spike in a histogram corresponds to the observation of, a, of an yeah. um so we have another question here what is one of the biggest or most common misconceptions that physicists or lay people but i think i'm particularly interested in in, in the question about physicists so the biggest or most common misconceptions physicists have which philosophy of physics clarifies in your opinion. Okay, good. Um, the biggest one, I think, is probably that we understand statistical mechanics properly. Um, I feel exactly the same way. That, that's maybe not one that I think most people jump to mind about, but but I completely agree. Yeah, it, I mean, when I when I was a physics undergraduate student, um, by which was in the early 90s, by that stage, people mid 90s, I guess, if I'm honest, um, uh, by that stage, it was kind of an open secret that quantum mechanics was mysterious in some respects. But nobody told you that we profoundly didn't understand questions of statistical mechanics. I, your, your intro lecture would sort of explain it and mention in passing that there were some historical things about reversibility and probability that back in the 19th century we didn't understand. Um, and you come out of that lecture and if you were paying attention, you still didn't really understand them. And you go to the textbooks and all, none of the textbooks would tell you it was mysterious, but the textbooks would all give you different incompatible accounts of it. Uh, I, think, I think philosophy of physics um, 
for, well, first for me, discovering philosophy of statistical mechanics is just a breath of fresh air. It's just a realization that actually we still don't fully understand these things and there are still controversies to this day. But you know, with, it's not that the cognoscenti in, in, in statistical mechanics don't, don't kind of know that, but it's extremely well hidden from uh, not so much the general public as the, the, general, um, the general community of people doing, doing um, graduate work in physics. I, I think it's, it's, it's not that hidden. I, I remember when I was learning statistical mechanics, I kept uh, going to the library and getting uh, more and more books on the subject. And it was remarkable, just what you said, that, that they all uh, spoke very definitively about how the subject worked, and yet they all told completely different stories right. about, about where the underpinnings came from. And, and so it, you know, I interpreted that at the time as, as me just not understanding something that clearly the people who worked on this understood. But, but over time, I realized this is, this is exactly an example of, of where there's some uh, philosophical incoherence about, about a subject. Um, so we have a couple more questions. Uh, we have three more minutes. I want to see how many we can get to. Um, uh, oh, so this is a this is a great one. Uh, what questions are you working on now? <laughs> great. Um, I, I think a lot about statistical mechanics and the direction of time at the moment. Um, I've been thinking quite a lot about symmetry, um, and in particular, I've been thinking about how we understand symmetry when we realize that the physical system we're considering usually isn't the universe. Philosophers of physics have a bit of a bad habit of always thinking about the whole universe. Uh, I've been trying to think about subsystems and how we think about what isolated subsystems are. Um, I'm also interested um, a lot at the moment in questions about how black holes evaporate and um, trying to almost do semi-pedagogical work and getting just clear on how the what, what, what the form of the argument is and which, which bits of the story we understand solidly and which bits are still kind of speculative. It'd be great to probe all of those, in particular black hole evaporation, which I'm sure some of the people here have heard about, but it would be great to go in more depth. We don't have the time. Um, so we, we, I think we have maybe time for one more question. Uh, let me ask this one. Um, so this question is, is the probability, so in your opinion, is the probability in quantum mechanics uh, inherent, or could we someday have a non-probabilistic understanding in the same way that probabilities in the macro world tend to converge to zero or one as we get more information? Okay. Um, this very much depends on your interpretation of quantum mechanics. Um, my subjective judgment is that it is highly unlikely that we will find a sort of classical deterministic theory that underlies quantum mechanics. I think there are, there are deep reasons to think that that's not going to happen. It's not, I, I can't prove it, um, but I can, I, can, I can prove that that theory will be pathological in a number of ways that I think is are very unlikely to be realized. Um, there's a different sense, I think, in which quantum mechanics does become fundamentally non-probabilistic, which is that I think the probabilities in quantum mechanics only arise in macroscopic contexts, and they only arise approximately. I think the underlying ma mathematics of quantum mechanics is not exactly probabilistic. Um, I think the best, the best sort of verbal way of describing it is as a sort of um, uh, a, a branching of, um, of, 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 of physical goings on. And that, but that branching structure looks like probability um, only, uh, only approximately. So there's a sense in which quantum mechanics, um, understood literally, understood in the many worlds way I like, does tell us that the world is not fundamentally probabilistic. But it doesn't. But not in the way we thought. Not in the way, not in the way of understanding the probabilities as simply a lack of a lack of information. You know, the weird thing about probability in in many worlds quantum mechanics is that. Uh, you could be God, you could know everything, literally everything about the third person description of the world, and yet you couldn't know which of two outcomes is going to happen. You'd have to, you have to be situated in the world for that to be a meaningful question. And if God is standing outside the world, then God can't answer that. So, so, the, so, so I mean, in, in a sense, probability is a good example of generally what physics has done for philosophy problems. It's, it, it's broadened our imaginations and showed us that there were ways, ways of resolving these conceptual things that hadn't occurred to us until the world gave us a hint. Um, so we're just uh, just about out of time. I wanted to give you the last word. Uh, do you have any parting thoughts or words you want to share with everybody? <laughs> um, nothing dramatically springs to mind. I, I, I mean, uh, th these are fun questions. They're great to think about. I think people from very different backgrounds can make contributions to them. Um, and people, um, sounds des desperately wishy-washy, but people working together and talking to each other can make a lot of progress with them. So for people who are thinking of research routes or people who are already in areas of academia. I, I think, I think um, 
uh, these are just great things to talk about and um, and engage with, but they get they are also things that if you engage with them can make genuine contributions to the scientific frontier and the philosophical frontier. Great. All right. So I think we're just out of time. I want to thank uh, Professor Wallace again for spending the time talking with all of us. I want to thank everybody who was here in attendance. I want to thank everybody for your amazing questions. I'm sorry we weren't able to get to everybody's questions. Uh, and again, I want to thank the Harvard Bookstore for organizing this. Um, this uh, particular book series, but all of your book talks have really been a, a wonderful thing in the middle of this uh, challenging time. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I just want to echo that. Thank you, David. Thank you, both of you, for this fantastic conversation. And thank you for all of your thoughtful questions, audience, and for spending your evening with us. Um, I just shared the link again in the chat to purchase philosophy of physics on harvard.com, or you can just go directly to harvard.com and search for it there. But yes, thank you so much. Um, thank you to our partners at Harvard University Division of Science and the Harvard Library. And from all of us in Cambridge, Massachusetts, have a great night. Keep reading and please be well. Thank you. <laughs>